this button. Ooh, I got this button. Alrighty. So, it's been a couple months ago since I was able to present to you guys last. Uh, and one of the things we were doing was we were just talking about tuning and tennis. And, and I kind of demonstrated a uh, quarter wave ground plane, right? And when we were trimming and adjusting and, and we were playing, remember? I don't know if you guys remember that, but there you go. And one of the antennas that we talked about was the roll up J curve. And this is not my idea. In fact, I'm not even sure whose idea it is anymore. It's, a, it's been around for a long time. But I'm taking the information from uh, Mr. Ed Fong. Uh, I don't remember his call sign, I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Uh, and this is on the DBJ1. Now this is a venerable and frequently maligned J-pole, and many people have tried to make these, and they get frustrated. Be included, okay? The DBJ1 is a single band antenna. Now he's got a cool one in here called the DBJ2. It's a dual band. He's got another article on a tri-band. My brain's going to explode if I try and make one of those. So we're just going to go with the DBJ1. The reason for that is the KISS rule really does apply, especially when you, as we're learning how to build and tune these. Now, building this is really not hard at all. Tuning it is a little on the tweaky side. And that's really the purpose of this exercise, is um, I've got materials, and we can actually sit down and build some of these out, okay? Now, here's the couple of little tidbits. I've got a working model here, and I built this in such a way that it fits together kind of like this. Slide it off. So it's an integrated uh, antenna, dealy, and pole all in one, right? So the advantage is fairly self explanatory. It makes it portable. The disadvantage is, well, it's a little awkward sometimes. <laughs> Jim, can you help me? I need yes. to slide That's that down I'm so I don't expose. So this is the business end right here. And this is the section, this whole section in here is the part that gets a little weird on the tuning, okay? And that's the purpose of today, is we're going to, uh, uh, I have sections of these, and we can sit down and actually build these out, okay? Because what I've found is that you can talk about it, you can read it, and go, okay, yeah, that's easy. And then when you go to do it, sometimes it's like, I'm missing something. And here's what the here's the deal. These measurements are for a specific let's turn it the right side up. For a specific kind of twin lead antenna wire. Now, I bought this years ago and I was using it for a transmission line, but I really don't like the antenna much anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this available to make roll of J poles. But this is just 75 ohm, no, 300 ohm twin lead. And it has a velocity factor. Can someone describe in brief terms what is a velocity factor for our new guys? <clears throat> Anybody want to take a stab at it? It's the um, effect of the, elect uh, the electrolytic effect of the speed of light through the conductor. Okay, let's put this in English now. In other words, the the uh, the electrons slow down when they when they hit the wire because there are electrolytes around it, and uh, if if it's not free space, it's going to it's it it uh, effectively increases the wavelength of okay. the of the. In other words, it has to be shorter than than the wavelength for it to work, and different conductors, different materials have different velocity factors. Okay. Jay, hold this. We're just going to show people what a velocity factor is. Okay? Really simple. All right? Now, hold that tight. And I flick this. You can see the wave move down the line. 
Watch it carefully. See that? Boing. You can actually see it moving. Well, what happens is in the wire, you have the same kind of thing, but that wave propagates down the wire, but it gets slowed down because of the of the insulation, the type of insulation, and the metal conductor. And so the wave slows down relative to free space. You see the same effect in water, right? Light comes through water and it refracts because it changes speed. It can only slow down and bend into speed out. So when that happens, this has to get shorter. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah? That's easy. How much shorter? You just well, it depends. And that's one of the tweaky little problems that often frustrate people when they build this, is that each piece of wire could be different, right? From one batch to the other, it might be a little bit different. Now, when I was building this one, I was just going absolutely nuts with this section right here. Yeah, I think it was this piece right here. And what I was doing is I was wrapping tape up on it to weatherproof it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, you know exactly where I'm going. I got it all done. Put it. You know, so I got it all tuned, right? Everything's good. All right. Yeah. All right. So I put my tape on, put it all back together. I'll just do a final check, make sure everything works. And it was completely out. Yeah. What the heck? So I took it all apart, retuned it all over again. Everything's good. Uh -huh. Retaped it, not associating the tape to the tuning. Boom! Completely <coughs> out tune again. Yeah. So what I learned is that yes, you can put tape on here to weatherproof it, but just uh, just enough. Don't put too much on there because what will happen is it detunes it. Now here's the other thing: you're trimming, trimming, trimming. Oops! I made it too short. Yeah. Guess what? You can add cheat. tape. You have a cable stretcher. Just wrap a little bit more tape on there, yeah. and it will you know, shift it up a little bit. It's not as good as having it the right length, but yeah. Again, we're going with the uh, get it done type of antenna approach. Okay. So there's a couple different things as a recap. Um, I'm sure that everybody knows this. But we'll go ahead and cover it uh, just as a refresher. I'm suspending, in the end here, I'm suspending the end of the antenna. There's a half wavelength, approximately half a wavelength, or electrically a half wavelength, from here to somewhere around here. Okay, And then you have about a quarter wavelength underneath it. So this bottom piece is the tuning section. We're end feeding... We're feeding a half-wave dipole on the end. And to do that, we have to transform the high impedance to get it down to the, the 50 ohms that we're going to feed it. And that's what that lower portion is. Okay? So, the first problem we have to solve is the velocity factor of the cable. And the way that I've been doing this, and maybe there's another way to do this, but the way I've been doing this is I take a quarter wavelength, and I forgot to bring it in. I take a quarter wavelength of wire, and I measure that, get that to about the right length, okay? And then I check where it's resonant at. And then I trim it down until I get it in the band that I'm looking for. That's my quarter wavelength, okay? So that should bring it down to about 50 ohms. Okay, now, you've got that quarter wavelength, you measure out three of those, because you've got quarter wave, quarter wave, that means you're half wave, then a quarter wave tuning. <coughs> then you adjust this part here. Now how do you tune it? This is, the, this is the part that I struggled with for a long time. I decided, now, John, you probably can give me some suggestions on this, but I, what I found worked is I leave this the three-quarter wavelengths long. 
That's this whole piece here. The whole wavelength, this whole piece is three quarter wavelength long, right? This is about a quarter wavelength, and then I get it all on my test jig in the pipe that I'm going to test it with, or free space, depending on how I'm going to use the antenna. And then I just slowly start trimming back until I get it down into the band I want. Now, by slowly trimming, I'm talking about tiny pieces, right? I'm talking about quarter inch. Six, no. That's too much? Way too much. Really? I'm talking about a sixteenth of an inch, just a nibble. Just a nibble. Just take your time. Nibble, 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 nibble. And you'll watch it go down on the band. And as you get down and you approach it, you'll 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 kind of like just tiny little, just tiny little nibbles that will bring it right down into your band. Okay? So you trim it, put it back together, measure. Yes. And if so I built this one for this pipe. Now, if I put that antenna, that's schedule 40, it's half inch schedule 40. Ed Fong recommends the three quarter inch schedule 20 because it has a thinner wall. Hard to get. Yeah. Turns out that Harbor, not Harbor Fate, um, Home Depot in Lompoc has a whole lot of this. It's rare. Irrigation. Yeah. So you can see it's a thinner wall. It's not for plumbing, it's for irrigation. See the difference? Yeah. Much different. Let's get to 40. 40 so notes. now, I have found that the this is pretty comparable to this in actual use as far as the mechanical use of it. It's a little bit lighter maybe. Um, but I found that it's a higher wind load. So it's not any more rigid. It still gets blown around the same as the quarter inch. The only advantage of the quarter inch is that it's physically a smaller bundle, especially when you're moving it around, right, when you're handling it. This is pretty durable. It works great. Um, and it's easier to swatch. And by swatching, that's this flaring out the end so that they just fit together. Okay. So, I don't know how many people are wanting to actually build or test or tinker today. Uh, I have brought some materials to make that available to people. I would ask for a small donation to help cover the cost of my materials. I have brought um, twin lead, which is not super easy to find anymore. I have a bag of... Fair, core, fair, I, I don't know. They are random, okay? So, you know, mileage may vary. But the whole purpose is just to choke down the RF coming back and decouple it from your transmission line. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of that. Now, I'm sure there's better ways of doing this than just my little approach here, but they're, they were cheap, so there you go. Yes, sir? Uh, you call it a roll-up J-pole. Uh, I take it the way you're putting it together and measuring it needs to be in that pipe. Yeah. Could you do it as a just a bare roll up? So I'm gonna, gonna borrow sure. I'm gonna borrow this one right here. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I'm considering making one today uh, that is just like this, right? And it is all floppy and it's just a and you just hang it up. There's a little hole here. You suspend it and off you go. Okay? Just be a little really longer. awesome. Sorry? Just be a little longer. It will be a little bit longer. Yeah. And so when we tune it, we have to tune it. And by the way, mistakes, I'll share my mistakes with you. You can't tape it to the outside no. of the PVC pipe because <laughs> <laughs> this will detune it. Yeah. So I have a piece of wood out there that we can suspend it from, so it's not right up against the wood, but next to the wood, okay? Then we'll tune it off of that, okay? And I have it set up so you can run it up and down like a little flagpole, okay? The key here is we get this three-quarter section, this whole section needs to be your three-quarter in three-quarter wavelength here, right? Once we get that and the velocity factor and all that sorted out, that's the, you don't mess with this, is what I've learned. You just 
adjust this tuning notch in very tiny bits until you get it down to the frequency you want. Yes, sir. I see thoughts, no, no. questions. Um, the only difference that I have in mine versus this one is that I would, I add, actually this one would be more for a bigger thorax. If I got the small ones here. Here we go. So one like this would just slide in here and help decouple it from the transmission line. Okay. Do you really need? This is a ferrite bead. A little ferrite bead. Okay. All it does is it just creates a higher impedance for the RF. So it hits this and it gets choked down. That's that's the principle there. Do you need it? No. I do it just because. Mostly because I have some. There you go. Okay. Um. I also brought a spool of RJ174. The 174 works really nice for short lengths because it is very, very flexible and compact. You do have some loss with it. So uh, that's available. And you guys can have some to take with you if you want to try Edfong's DBJ2. Um, I'm not to that step, step yet. Uh, when I finally figure out how to build and tune that rascal, I'll be glad to share it. And that'll be a dual band. Okay? Alrighty. Um, can I see a show of hands of those who are interested in actually constructing and tuning? I see one hand. Alright. Um, well, there we go. Uh, you're welcome to stay, you're welcome to go, you're welcome to participate, hang out, talk, whatever you want to do. We're going to start the process up here, then we'll be moving outside to actually do the tuning and all of that. Because I find you need to be in free space, away from other objects. Because these antennas, like many antennas, are very sensitive to objects nearby, and then it will detune them. You're broken. <laughs> I got a question. Go for it. On your RF feed that you put over your uh, wire. Yeah. Uh, I'm using that on my transmission line to a, a vertical I have yeah. up north. And um, anyway, I was wondering is your output power from your transmitters going up that line when it comes up to that ferrite feed? Or, uh, or what keeps it from killing the signal there instead of, well, I want it there so one's going to have reflection and won't come back down to my transmitter. But. So, the re okay, so I am not an expert on this. I'll give you the best that I can. Is that, is that fair? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the, the point of this is you've got a transmission line, a coaxial transmission line. In theory... The signal going up, so you're going to have a positive wave and a negative wave on the conductor inside the coax. And those signals should have a net zero. That makes sense? If they're in balance. Right? So if I have a positive wave and a negative wave, the net voltage, net current, net field should be zero. Now, as I understand it, and I don't fully understand it, okay, is that fair? Is that the signal is predominantly on the um, inner conductor and surface effect, it's going to be on the inner layer of the shielding. Now, effectively, what you end up with is two paths for the RF on the shield, the inner layer and the outer layer. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise the impedance of the outer layer to make it less favorable for the current to flow on the outside of the, co of the, of the coax. That's it. Now, if there's an imbalance in your system, so if you have a fully balanced antenna, there should be very little 
currents coming back. And if it's tuned and balanced, you should have very little reflected energy coming back. But what we're trying to do is any of that current that is being reflected, we want it to try and encourage to go down the inner, not on the outer. Now, on the, if you look at a J-pole, I don't have an easy way to, it's hard to show you this, but if you look at a J-pole, is it a balanced antenna? No. Not really, no. Right? It's not like a regular dipole. And so you will have some energy trying to come back. Now, do you really need these beads on a little J-pole like this for low power? No. I do it just because I have them and what the heck, why not? Right, so. Also, here's the other opinion. This is opinion, not fact, okay? In my opinion, with the beads, it's easier to tune. Yeah. Because I don't have weird interactions with the Always. transmission line. Always easier to tune with a mallet on it. Okay, there you go. As far so, as I'm concerned, all antennas need a mallet. It, you know, when I first got into ham radio, I didn't understand that principle, and I always had an SW. Uh, I always had a field strength meter sitting on top of my rig, and it would bounce around when I would when I'd operate, and I thought that was normal. No, you shouldn't have RF coming back it lighting also, up your shack. <laughs> if there's another transmitter, if there's energy not being produced by the antenna, it will in impact onto the the outer conductor, and, and that voltage will be seen on your, your uh, the output of your transmitter. Question. Yes, sir. Including lightning. You're talking about that, the, the power coming back. Mm -hmm. Is that also called the reflected power? No. No. I, not to my understanding. Mode. <coughs> so... <coughs> Okay, I, I'm on the fringe of my understanding, so take it as okay. such, okay? Hey, I learned from school. School of hard okay. Knocks, okay? Picture in your mind's eye a, a teeter-totter, yeah. right? It, that's a balanced system, okay. right? Yeah. And if everything is in balance and everything is in tune, you should have very little to no reflected energy. But if you feed this off-center like we're doing here, now you're... You, you've got the physics involved, you're potentially going to have some energy bouncing back because it's not balanced anymore. If you have it out of tune, you're going to have energy bouncing back. Okay, And so that's the nature of AC going through a transmission line and all of that. Is that why you, we use a pallet, a bailum? Sorry? Use Is a, that why we use a bailum? That is one of the reasons, and there's many reasons for balance, for balance, mm -hmm. many reasons. Now, that, in my opinion, a common mode balance is a valuable tool to help reduce that. It, look at the, the word itself, balance, unbalance. That's what right. balance means. Ba going from balance to unbalance or bad. Okay. So, but there's different kinds of balance. Yes. That makes it interesting. They're, they're impedance so, conversion balance. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So I have uh, some. I have small amounts of of coax. I have a few twist-on connectors. These things are horrible, but uh, they'll get you by until you can get your own connectors uh, to put on the cable. Uh, they're quick. Um, they're quick and dirty. Uh, get you by type of connector. Um, Where I have. Ferrite beads. I keep wanting to call them ferrets, but they're not. They're not little ferrets. They're ferrite. Ferret beads. <laughs> um, I have twin lead. No. Uh, did Did you bring some twin lead? I did not. Okay, so I've got twin lead for you. Um, I've got tape, soldering iron, cables. I've got everything we need to make these up. I even have some extra PVC pipe if someone wants to make. Uh, I'll. Just, get you started and then I can show people how to swatch these to make them plug in like this one does. They just put together. I use a hot heat gun. Hot thingy, that's it. I use a hot thingy. Um, 
So I have a heat gun over there. Uh, it's just a little cheapy, and that's all you need. It's just you just heat these up, get them soft, kind of like a little mushy thing, and then you. Yeah. It's nothing super scientific about it. Any questions? Questions? Comments? What are you going to use this antenna for? And what's the reason for building it versus a a collinear or some other? Antenna? Yeah. What? And also, what frequency are you using? Is this two meters or what? This will be for two meters. We could build one for 440 if you want. We can build one for 20 meters, but I don't have enough cable. Is there any gain with this antenna, or is this just a... No, it's going to be basically the same as a regular dipole. About 30 dB. So, the, yeah. the, 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 the advantage of a, of a J-pole in general is there's no ground plane. The advantage of this, did I give you yours back? Yeah. Let me borrow it back. The advantage of this arrangement is that, as you can see, this is a fully contained antenna, no extra bits. It's really clean. And you can just hang it and get on the air. And this is going to have a huge gain over any rubber duck. It's going to have gain over. Uh, a quarter wave ground plane, mostly because it brings the radiation pattern down a little bit. Okay. Um, At the if resistance. You, and you if if, if you body. can, the biggest thing you can do, in, in my limited experience, the best thing you can do with any antenna system is get it away from other structure and get it up. If you can get a VHF antenna outside and elevate it, now your range goes up significantly. And so this is an antenna that is an alternative to a rubber duck. A quick, throw together, temporary type of antenna. It's highly portable, it's lightweight, um, it's fairly rugged. I haven't, well, okay. One caveat I wish to make. These antennas are really not meant for higher power. Right. On a Jamboree on the Air one year, we were using a roll-up J-pole in, in a pipe like this, and there was moisture inside that I didn't know about. <laughs> and what happened is it started to burn. Literally, smoke was coming out of the pipe. Okay, We were transmitting about 50 watts, and this little, little doohickey right here, it arced from here through the piping, back down to here, it was arcing on the surface inside of the pipe and then hitting back here and it was literally burning the wire back and melting the plastic. Yeah. You can imagine that that is not going to give you the yeah. best results. Yeah, also the final doesn't like it either. Well, that and the radio is going to be a little pissy about it too because it's like, what's going on? <laughs> So these antennas are awesome, the roll-up J-poles, because they're kind of like a hasty, quick, portable antenna. I mean, that's pretty convenient. You can just throw that in a Ziploc bag and throw it in your go bag, and you've got a good, solid antenna. Is it permanent antenna? Maybe, if you build one like this, put it in a PVC pipe. I ran one like this for about, three years. Oh, by the way, if you have an antenna outdoors and you do the PVC, DBJ1 or DBJ2, in a PVC pipe, make a weep hole. I yeah. didn't. Yeah. A weep hole is a tiny hole in the bottom of the PVC pipe on the very bottom. Because what will happen is condensation will build up inside of that pipe. I have no idea how it got in there, but I had about an inch of water that accumulated inside of that PVC pipe. How it got in there, I have no idea. But a little tiny weep hole will help that to drain out. Weird stuff. Weep holes, gotta love them. You, you mentioned the, yes, the radiation pattern. Yeah. Is it the double O? What, what does that look like? It looks like a bagel or a donut. Okay. okay? Now, the J pole is a little bit distorted because it has that J at the bottom. But for all practical purposes, it looks like a donut. Okay. 
aiming around the horizon. So that, that, that basically says you're not sending very much signal off the end, right? So it's not going to be very good for satellites. I have to fight. <laughs> okay. Oh, I was listening to the space station one time, and I was like, what the heck? And I go, oh, <laughs> there it is. No. <laughs> not the best intent for that. But. All right. Any other questions? I've got a question off the subject, though. Okay, go for it. My gel cell battery mm -hmm. died. Okay. They say if you buy a regular car battery, you can charge that regular car battery in your house mm -hmm. without danger if you yeah. use a trickle cell or a trickle battery sure. charger. Yeah is to the brain trust is that true so there's a couple things i would say right off the top right off the a couple things of safety anytime you have a battery a lead acid battery liquid wet cell battery type right you have a corrosive agent in there so if it tips over you have to be aware of that okay the other thing is anytime you're charging there's a possibility of it putting off Hydrogen, oh, oxygen. hydrogen, unless it's a sealed battery, those are less apt to do that. Yeah. So you have hydrogen, oxygen that it could potentially generate. Okay. So if you're in an overcharged situation, <coughs> it could be off gassing hydrogen, and oxygen, and that could be combustible. And sulfuric acid. Okay. So you've got that. Make sure it's properly fused because you don't want it to short out on something. In can cause an electrical fire that way either. All right, all of that to the side. The way I do it is I use a charge controller, okay? Because what that does is it will ramp up, do a bulk charge, and when it gets to a certain percentage, it then drops into the trickle charge and maintains the battery. <coughs> That's gonna be your most reliable <coughs> approach and healthiest for the battery. The little trickle chargers do trickle, yeah. but they're not smart. Okay. All right. You would prefer, though, also a, uh, not a, actually a starter battery, but a heat cycle battery? Well, it depends on the application. Not an expert on batteries. I just, from my own use of them, okay? Uh, a deep cycle may not necessarily be the best choice for every application. So uh, I would encourage that you do your own research on that and dig into it because they make certain batteries for certain applications, right? Some batteries are more built for, or built more for uh, high current short usage, a starter battery. And then others are going to be ruggedized for lower current over a longer period of time, like a UPS. or high or high mechanical vibration environments, All right? Some are going to be designed so you could actually invert them, turn them upside down, yeah. right? Some are going to have a longer life shelf shelf life, and others that's not a bigger as big a concern. It depends what you want them for. Yeah, the yeah. application specific. And there's so many different chemistries of batteries yes. out there today yeah. that you might want to look into what is the application and then decide from there. Because yeah. there's Don't some really on. cool technologies out there. Don't go on by reports. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, Take I it outside. Pulled up J pole, but it was made out of copper pipe. Yeah. And I just didn't uh, solder the <coughs> yeah. lights together, and it worked pretty well. I had the little rubber band inside to yeah. keep all the pieces together. I have one of those too. I have basically it's just a regular dipole. I'm sorry, a regular J pole that fits together. I use um, uh, tent poles in mine. Aluminum tent poles rather than the copper. 
and it looks like a regular J bolt, but it folds, right? The advantage of this is that this is relatively inexpensive, relatively <coughs> robust for the environment, and if I get it lost or damaged, I'm out maybe 10 bucks, maybe 15, if you count the connector, <laughs> okay? So th these antennas, once you get past that pain point of tuning them, tuning it, yeah. are relatively inexpensive, easy, portable. The, the copper ones are great, but they're a little on the heavy and a right. little on the bulky side. Yeah. So it's all trade-offs. The copper handled a lot more power. I could run 100 watts on a copper J pole and not even worry about it. This, <laughs> no. they're going to be wondering where all that smoke is coming from. <laughs> 50 watts. We'll burn these. I'll tell yeah. you that. All right. Uh, that's about all I have as far as blah, blah, blah at this point. Um, those who are interested in actually doing the hands on portion of this, Come on up, and uh, we'll start uh, working out the instructions and measurements, and we'll start playing. Okay? Make fixtures for uh, mounting different antenna elements, or poles, or pipes, or something. Work some down the inside, warm it up evenly. Now, this is not me. Gotcha. Warm it up. Yeah. Um, now, that, this isn't my idea. I got this whole principle from a Boy Scout idea. And what they do is they take hot sand, heat up sand inside of a bowl pan, and they take a funnel, they put caps on one end, and they pour hot sand into the PVC pipe, let it get hot, and then they take the PVC pipe and put it on a core. Bend it into the shape they want, then they clamp it down, and then take the plugs out, the caps off, and pour the sand out. Cool. That's how they make snowshoes. Now, if you use the hotter, um, I would use, if you use whatever you get, you have to put it on the low set. Right? You don't want, you don't want to. Because these things will toast like a marshmallow. It stink like a blade. Okay, you see, you see it there? Yeah. You don't to get there. I'm just going to keep warming it a little bit more. It's a heat gun. I need a little bit bigger. Just need to open that up a little bit bigger. Now, I'm going to need a little bit bigger piece of almost half Yeah, you have to you have to shape it a little bit. I need a little bit bigger piece of uh, piping to go inside of here. The trick is you get it warm. It's all pliable. It'll set in whatever position you're in. So if you get it crooked, it stays crooked. Which is kind of handy. So basically, that's the story. 
the worst yeah. one I've got. Probably where you're at. We're doing a lot of this. It's probably what I'm thinking. Yeah, exactly. That's what I really want to do. Yeah, yeah. 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 I have to find a little bit bigger handle. You can see the principles. This never occurred to me to even try. Did, did you do these, or these are ones you did? Yeah. These are ones you did? If you were a all Okay, so these are ones that I've done already. This is on the quarter inch right here. So that's the quarter inch schedule 40 right there. I get the idea. I see it. I can do it now. Yeah, that'll probably be a little big, but. Uh, yeah, you have to heat it up. You can see that I'm getting it soft again. Yeah. You have to heat it up, and then it gets a little on the weird side. Because what will happen is if you do it wrong, it'll lock together, and then you're stuck. <laughs> so then you have to heat it up again and fight it. What I normally do is if I'm making a permanent connection, I'll swatch it, put them together, and then I'll put a rivet in and lock them together if I want to put a little bit of silicon grease on it. Silicon grease will tolerate it. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let me see that little one. So that's like that. This is not going to down too much. Yeah. It doesn't even get past that lip. You can see it's already held that like, shape. So you got to get the, uh, the, the, the stick is the, the shape right and all the just pop right in there. That's just to help me keep it straight. Yeah, man, straight. Straight, that's true. Once you get past that lip. All right, you know, I'm going to write the USD article. Oh, what's your name on it? Seriously? Seriously? This is not that. This is not that. This can't be that. It's not new, but QST doesn't give a rat's butt about news. They just want something they can pump. See how it throws on it? Take that. You're going to have to grip it. I bet if you put a little bit of dialectic grease on you, it's not Yeah, I should have been twisting it, but it's cooling. So I'll have to warm it back up, and then I'll, I'll, I'll redo it. I'll keep it, I'll keep it moving. So, so this idea is, I, I got this from looking at the electrical conduit, and I go, this just swaps out. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just how they sell it. I think it's a common process. I think the nice thing about See how far off I am. Not bad. But you can see it twisted a little bit. 
That's basically the principle. Who knew that was the piece that was going to be the hit? <laughs> no, then this tuning also is, is good. Okay, uh, um, do you know... What's his name? I know him. I can see his face. He used to live in this area. He moved up north. WB6. Shoot. It'll come to me. He's big in radio direction finding on 80 meters. Oh, you mean Dale? No. Dale Hunt. Oh, Dale Hunt. Yeah. WB6 BYU. I've heard you. Oh, yeah. yeah. WB6 BYU. This suggestion in an article for tuning. So that's not my idea. So that's the um, that's the actual um, uh, that's the tuning part of the stuff. That's the stuff. Okay. That's the stuff. And, and this is just this, this is just parallel set down there. These are three beams. This is just for a temporary shield conductor, just a direct connection. That's your standard connection. So, watch those videos that I link. And then about an inch. The guy has recommendations in his channel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's tested everything. You know, he lives off the grid. It's basically, we don't live off the grid, but it might as well if there's a current. You can feel the roughness in there. It's not if, it's when. When there's a power tank. And on this one, and now brush it off. And then, yeah, it's not going to be this weekend. Try it with a little silicon dielectric region. Buy it in any auto parts. Okay, see. That's that's why if Ernie, thank you for jumping in on the net the other day. And you came in real nice. All right. Oh, by the way, all right. Do you want to make oh, yeah. one of these two? Yes. yes. The roll-up version. Yeah. yeah. Right, so we're gonna have to have to do the actual measurement. Yeah. Okay. I will. Okay. And then what about the yeah. 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 Because the block factor. You know now that Ray is is down there. You know. Well, it's going to be different than the article, but it's going to be different than the article. Yeah, by golly, no kidding. Similarity is great. Yeah, let's get a solar panel. The smaller so we can do it. I saw you. Even with some more. It's expensive. They're 12 volts. Yes. Wait, what? Is to spin the extra minute to get the three way refrigerator. 12 volt, 110 propane. And just always have a bottle of propane. propane a bottle of propane, propane has uh, tens of thousands of watts of energy. So you only have to. You only have to. You know, put it in your garage. I mean, a little. I have some with me. So what I'm thinking are the six. So we can do that. How long you want it? Look on to the Well, you got to be stronger than I have about I have about ten feet on this. But you're not planning on I got AC back to the grid. No, no, no. Low voltage backup power. Uh, 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 uh,
Yeah, yeah. that's really good. Cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, okay. You yeah. need a charge management, you need a charge solar charge management. It's a box, solar panel hooks to it, the battery hooks to it, and the load hooks to it. The charge of the solar panel to keep the battery charged. It's a battery charge. All right, so let's head outside. Why don't you take one of these things and count them? It has a theory of operation. And also from there, I can do a solar panel or charge controller to battery. Yeah, it's a box. Tinker away. So it looks like they were just two that I'll, I'll be fine. There's actually one that you can get you with a window on it also. It has an input for the window, has input for the solar panel, connection for the battery, and connection for the load. You don't hook the load to the battery, you hook the load to the manager. Because the manager controls what the battery is doing. Okay, so if I'm cooking, I can't talk. You have your solar panel. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there are they 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 they